secret? Is it safe? Ah, yes. An unlimited warrant to be an agreements officer. This is a powerful tool allowing you to use other transaction authority. Can I have it back? But in the wrong hands, it can lead to reckless contracting, which can waste money, raise scrutiny, and cause overregulation. Give it to me. Now, Fardo, you must use this tool responsibly. It's my precious. It's mine! Fardo Baggins, I'm not trying to rob you! I'm trying to help you use OTAs properly. Gunthoff, what is that noise? They come from the dark recesses of gray corridor offices, seeking to take your warrant and your soul. Do they have a name? They go by the name of Lawyers, run, you fool! We'll check back on our friends from Middle Earth in a minute. But first, let's talk a little bit about the magic of OTAs. We'll start with the basics, and toward the end of the video, we'll discuss how to use it. So OTA means Other Transaction Authority, and that authority is given to certain agencies to enter into transactions other than procurement contracts, in other words, the FAR, uh, other vehicles like grants, cooperative agreements, CRADAs, and other federal lab vehicles, basically everything else. So if you're entering into a transaction other than a procurement contract using the FAR, that means that you don't use the FAR. But Will, doesn't that mean you still have to use SAM.gov to publicize your requirements? Nope, part five doesn't apply. But Will, doesn't that mean that you have to follow SICA and the competition requirements? No, part six doesn't apply. But Will, doesn't that mean, no, oh, sorry. I didn't let you finish. No, I was just going to say, doesn't that mean that if you use options, you have to use all the regulations around options, like letters of intent, things like... No, Part 17 does not apply, Will. OTs actually started around 1958 with NASA as a product of the space race. So in addition to things like Tang and memory foam, we can thank NASA for giving us OTs. Thanks, NASA. Later on, the DOD started introducing OTs. Around the 1980s, it became codified. And now we have OTs, especially prototype and production OTs, being used pretty regularly in the Department of Defense. Now, we're going to use the OTA statute for the DOD as a way to explain, but the reality is a lot more agencies are getting authorities to use OTs. So if you're another agency, my guess is you're going to have this authority soon, and it's good to know what it is and how to use it. Okay, we're going to talk about three types of OTs. There's one for research, and that's in, for the DOD, 10 U.S.C. 4021, that's for research. Usually it's for dual-use type arrangements where the government uh, and industry are coming together to partner for something that can benefit the government but also benefit the commercial marketplace. So there's resource sharing as well with research OTs. So the, the industry puts in about at least 50% of their own funds to help fund this, this research OT. Okay, the second type is a prototype OT. I've got my notes here, so let's talk about the prototype. So a prototype OT allows the agency to engage in a transaction for a prototype directly relevant to enhancing mission effectiveness is the term there. What is a prototype? Well, prototype is very broad, so don't think just emerging technology. The purpose of an OT, which we'll talk about here in a minute, is to bring in innovations to the government. So it can be a business process, a novel idea, a way to uh, introduce agile development into the government. These can all be prototypes. And if you just award prototype OTs to anybody, there has to be at least one non-traditional company. And if, or they have to all be small businesses. Or if, they're not, if there's not at least one traditional company or all small businesses, at least one third needs to be paid by the large company. Or the senior procurement executive just says, yeah, 
we're, we're gonna do it anyway. So let's say you release a prototype OT and the prototype goes really well, and you wanna go back to that same company and start producing these and cranking them out to your end user and your mission. That's the third kind of OT. It's called a production OT. And you can go straight from a prototype OT directly to that company to create a production OT, but only if you do these three things, and I'll mention them. So, uh, the follow-on, the production, has to be mentioned in the solicitation. You have to have competed the original prototype OT, but we'll talk about what competed means in, in, with OTs. And then you have to kind of define what it means to have that prototype complete, and the contractor for the prototype OT has to have completed, or at least a portion of, that prototype. So why would you want to take advantage of OTA? So here's some benefits. One, it fosters new relationships with non-traditional companies, mainly those kind of companies that have good innovations they can provide to the government, but they're not going to work with the government if they're under the federal acquisition regulations. The second is that as a consequence of number one, you're going to broaden the industrial base available to the government. Take artificial intelligence, for example. If the government really wants to take advantage of this new AI technologies that are being performed by non-traditional companies, they're going to want to broaden the base of the companies they usually talk to. In order to do that, they're going to want to provide a vehicle that is maybe more flexible, quicker, and maybe has a cheaper product design process in it. And that's the third advantage. This is flexible. This should be fast. This should be tailored in a way that brings in that kind of company to help your mission. Now, with so many flexibilities and benefits provided by OTs, they also lend themselves to two major dangers. One is just reckless use of OTA. Now remember, you don't have the FAR, you don't have the guidelines to follow. The second danger is actually a reaction to the first danger. Due to maybe a lack of trust or bad instances of reckless AOs, there could be a over-regulation of OTAs through local policies that turn OTs basically into FAR vehicles. Many offices unfortunately look at OTA as an unnecessary danger and decide not to use them. Let's check back on our friends in Middle Earth and see how they're doing with the OTA power that they have. Fardo, the power and flexibility offered by OTs has become too powerful. AOs are using it too recklessly. We must destroy it and go back to the far. Grab your warrant and come with me. I'm sorry, Govdov. This is the wrong paper. This is a journal I've been writing. It's called Like and Subscribe if you're enjoying this content. It's the best way to support our channel and back again. Now come, Fardo. Grab the warrant and let's go. So let's talk about some of the ways we can navigate the dangers of OTAs so that we can really start enjoying the fruits that OTs have to offer. And we have to start by talking about the role of the agreements officer structured environment. You should not be cutting and pasting previous contracts. A lot of times you'll have to have the strategic mindset to work new flexible processes because every new prototype would be different. So an AO should have good business acumen. They should know the foundational principles of federal procurement laws. They should be creative. They should be industrious. They should be proactive. They should be procurement champions. Now, we have a video on that if you want to watch how to be a procurement champion. It goes really well with creating OTs. You want to be that kind of procurement professional if you're really going to handle OTs the right way. But it's not just COs that need to step up their game in order for them to be AOs. It's the AOs bosses as well, the management that needs to step up in order to give AOs what they need to succeed. Here's some things AOs need from their offices. They need to be trusted. That office needs to put that AO into a position of trust where they trust them. They need to support and protect them. Remember, these AOs are gonna be working in unstructured environments to make great stuff happen with non-traditional companies. They need to show that protection. And then finally, they need to encourage them to step up into an AO position, and they need to give them really good training so that they are equipped to work in this type of environment. Okay, finally, let's talk about maybe some tips on how to do OTs. So first of all, the FAR doesn't apply. So in, in the words of two very talented ladies who do this a lot, don't FAR all over your OTA. But you're not over-regulating OTs the way the FAR is regulated. You want to keep it flexible, 
and open for the benefit of those non-traditional companies. All right, we're gonna talk about competition and we're gonna talk briefly about the terms and conditions. So there is competition. It's to the maximum extent practicable. It's not practical. Practical means you know something that's useful. Practicable means it's feasible or possible. So you're trying to compete as much as feasible. Who's deciding what the maximum extent practicable is? The AO. It should be at their discretion to determine whether or not that maximum extent practicable of competition was satisfied. And good AOs will not use OTs to bypass competition. That's not the purpose of OTs, to bypass competition. Remember also that you must compete a prototype OT in order to directly move on to production. So competition still is necessary. It just doesn't have to be done in the way that part six of the FAR articulates. You can keep your competition flexible. You can tailor it. You can do multi-phase approach where you just start off with a couple paragraphs and a statement of objectives you know, with your problem. You get a whole bunch of proposals and you let those offerers know, hey, on the second phase, we may fine tune what the solution is. OTs allow you to engage in contracting with agility, agile contracting. OTs and agile go together like bread and butter. They go together like the eye of Sauron and Visine. It's a perfect match. Okay, tips and tricks on some terms and conditions. Remember, it's a clean canvas. You're starting from scratch with these agreements, potentially, and you can put stuff in as, it, as you see fit. So first, contract form. Now, you don't have to use an SF 1449. You don't have to use the forms that the FAR requires you to use. You could just use a Word document. It's really whatever makes the most sense to the company. Price reasonableness. We're not looking at part 15. We're not looking at necessarily uh, price competition or uh, looking at historical prices. Remember, there may not be historical prices. We're talking about new prototypes. There may not be competitive prices. If you release a SU and you're getting different proposals that are offering maybe different things, it's, it's gonna be hard to, to kind of do a like comparison for price competition. You may have to be creative about that price reasonableness. You still need it but you don't have to follow exactly uh, what the FAR says about that price analysis. Intellectual property terms. This is one of the greatest assets of OTs. Part 27, you don't need to follow. So you can use tailorable commercial terms that are best for that company. I worked with a great lawyer in the Department of Defense where she actually opted to use layman's terms to describe intellectual property. She wanted to take the legalese out of it and really explain the rights that both parties wanted in terms of intellectual property in a way that everybody understood so that we had a mutual understanding of who was owning what and the format in which that intellectual property was gonna be delivered to the government. It was great and it was possible because we had the flexibility we were using OTs, we could put that language in. The other thing too is that part 32, contract financing does not apply. So there's not a lot of burdensome regulations that would make it challenging for you to provide that upfront financial assistance to some of these small non-traditional companies you could do that in a proper way. Now keep in mind too, because part one does not apply, you really don't have contracting officers, representatives. There's no cores really with OTs, but you still need to have someone that's measuring the performance of the contract. You want those performance metrics in your OTs. And again, Agile and, uh, and OTs, you can tailor your performance metrics to have it centered on end user value. It can be challenging to navigate yourself around these very very beneficial vehicles. You can reach out to other AOs who've done this before. You can also reach out to us with the link below. Uh, we modernize acquisitions and help our clients modernize acquisitions. Now for that contracting office out there, you need to remember your AOs are like orcas. They need to be free. If you are burdening them with local policies and regulations to try to control how OTs are done, you need to maybe examine yourself and maybe time to free Willie. Give your AOs that ocean to swim in so they can do some great stuff for your mission. Good luck. Come, Fardo, come. Join me up here. Now, here we are, Mount Doom. Let's rid ourselves of this reckless vehicle. Fado, do 
it! It is the only responsible way! But Govdov, what if we can use these OTs for good? What if there are good AOs out there that can use OTs to deliver true results? Fardo, my boy, you are right. We must put our trust in AOs to be able to make the right decisions and for the contracting offices not to overregulate that powerful tool. Well, let's go home, I guess. Got about three months back. Let's go. Come on, Frodo. Fardo, turn. Turn, Fardo.